Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm not going to introduce the last speaker, uh, but I would uh, like to thank you all for coming, and in particular, the student that has provided the posters for the poster competition earlier today. And uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, I would like to thank the crew here at the Science Library who is making this possible. And uh, the the person who is going to introduce the last speaker is Karolina Mu, and she is, of course, a part of it. So give the Science Library a hand, and Karolina, the podium is yours. Thank you, Martin. Um, wow, this is amazing. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I hope you had a great day so far, and that you grabbed something to drink and eat outside. On behalf of the Science Library, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this last part of PhD Day 2014, where you will hopefully laugh and pick up useful hands-on tips on how to survive that PhD journey that you have embarked on. I'm Caroline Moe, and I'm a PhD from the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences here at the University of Oslo. I'm, I was knocked out by the experience, and I'm currently in recovery, but still, I am a PhD. When I first started my PhD, uh, let me be frank here, I did not have the faintest clue what it was all about. A few years later, I think it's safe to say that I was romantic and naive. So how did I, did I deal with uh, and survive the challenges and frustrations that piled up over the years? One thing that I know for sure is that I would not have been standing here as a PhD without Jorge Sham. If I had not known that napping, cutting, pasting, and screaming for your mother are normal things to do in this game, I would have signed in at the nearest hospital, self-diagnosed with some sort of Alzheimer's because every day is just like in kindergarten. And if I had not been introduced to seminar bingo, I would have fallen asleep during, say, 90% of the seminars instead of 10%. And I would have gotten it totally wrong with my supervisor. From time to time, it felt like I did anyway. But at least it was explained to me why. Because when you do a PhD, is almost like being married, right? And 
I would not have made any friends without learning the etiquette and culture that I picked up from PhD Comics. Like, how's research going? <laughs> <laughs> and when will you finish that thesis? Okay, I'll learn not to ask those questions. It's safe to say that I spent um, a few, say, weeks doing nothing but read PhD comics. When the PhD life was too much to deal with, as it definitely was from time to time, phdcomics.com was the place you could find me. That is where I found the inspiration to turn tears into laughter, to turn defeats into victory, where I learned that other people had suffered and surprisingly survived the same stuff that I was dealing with. The stage is very soon ready for the talk on academic anxiety, procrastination, and the roles of PhDs in society. But note that the evening will not end with the talk. After the talk, you can buy books with comics from PhD Comics and get them signed. And when the books are sold out, we will show the PhD movie here. I hope you're all as excited as I am. Please welcome the creator of PhD Comics and the psychological advisor of more PhD candidates than you can imagine. Jorge Sham. Please give him a hand. <laughs> wow. Hi. Bored and corded? <laughs> eh? That is all the Norwegian that I know. That's it. Well, uh, thank you, Caroline, and thank you to the Science Library and to Liva and the Dean for inviting me here today, organizing this great day for you guys. Let's give them a quick applause, please. Yeah. But uh, mostly, thank to all of you for coming out here. Look how many of you came here today. Thank you for coming. I know it's uh, Thursday. It's 4.30 in the afternoon. It's a beautiful day here <laughs> for Norway. <laughs> and so I'm sure right now at this hour, most of you would much rather be, you know, in your office, working hard starting your day. <laughs> but instead, you came here to procrastinate. So thank you, yeah. Uh, well, let me see. Uh, let me get a sense of who is here. Uh, how many of you here are PhD students, graduate students? Whoa. Great. Or graduate students, master's, master's students? Yeah. All right. Do we have any uh, undergraduates, undergraduates, university? Ooh, <laughs> three of you, run. Uh, what about um, professors? Do we have any professors here today? Professors? All right, two, three. We're like, oh. Thank you for kind of raising your hand. Thank you for raising your hand. That is very brave of you. Yeah. Uh, security, can we... Um, Get them out. And uh, I would also ask about postdocs. But you know, I think they're used to being ignored. <laughs> Why bother? Uh, no, so today um, I'm just going to talk about my PhD experience. It's going to be, I guess, if you came to the talk a few years ago, um, you, re you really should have graduated. <laughs> by now. But basically, I just talk about my PhD. So I did my PhD at uh, Stanford University. I was there, and it took me about <laughs> several years. <laughs> and in fact, my thesis, my research, focused on making these small robots that can run like cockroaches. Yeah. So here's a quick movie of what these robots look like. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I like to show this movie. I feel like it's very important. I like to show it because uh, for two reasons. First of all, I feel like the movie really, really kind of captures what it feels like to be a PhD student. <laughs> you know, you're running the whole time, but you're not going anywhere. Meanwhile, there's a more intelligent being stamping you down. Uh, no, I also like to show it because um, the other reason I like to show it is because it's the only way people will look at my research <laughs> because it's been very clear to me by far more popular than the research and my thesis. By far more popular has been uh, what I was doing when I should have been doing research, when I was procrastinating. Uh, do you guys know that word, procrastination? When I was procrastinating, uh, and I was procrastinating making these comic strips called Piled Higher and Deeper, or PhD comics. And so how it all started for me was uh, it was my first uh, term in graduate school, and I saw this advertisement in the newspaper asking for people for to uh, turn in and come up with ideas for comics. And I remember thinking at the time that, you know, there are a lot of stories, a lot of, you know, stories and situations about being a graduate student, a master's student, a PhD student, that you really don't see anywhere else in, in popular culture. You know, all the TV shows, all the movies out there, they're always about, you know, cops, police, and detectives, and um, lawyers, right? All the dramas, they're always about doctors and, and um, um, I mean, the real doctors. Real doctors. <laughs> the kind that help people. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, but, you know, um, yeah, most of the stuff out there wasn't about graduate students. And so I asked myself the question, you know, who is this, who is the graduate student? What is going on? Who is this creature? Homo procrastinus. What is happening inside of their complex and complicated brains? And uh, it turned out, apparently, <laughs> it's not really that complicated. And I mean that in the sense that most of the PhD students that I knew, the graduate students that I knew, weren't these kind of crazy, eccentric, weird stereotypes, caricatures that you see in popular culture and TV shows, whenever they try to show a scientist or someone who happens to be very smart, they always show these kind of geeky, weird people. <laughs> Big Bang Theory. <laughs> but you know, most of the people that I knew in graduate school, they're really just kind of regular people. You know, we were mostly just trying to survive the experience. And so that's what the comics became about. They became about surviving those meetings with your professors, where you feel about this big. The uh, begging that you have to do. So please, can I do free work for you? Actually, the lab floor needs a good mopping. Uh, let's see, they're, all, they're also about uh, being a teaching assistant. <laughs> and trying to teach undergraduates, university students. Uh, no offense to the three of you here today. <laughs> I'm sure you're fine. Uh, let's see, they're also about um, those late night project sessions. And as uh, Caroline said, learning about grad student etiquette. Well, you should never ask a PhD student. And they're also uh, about those uh, oral exams or qualifying or thesis defense, you know. <laughs> I, I'm still in trauma <laughs> over those. Uh, and then eventually there were other characters in the comic, for example, Cecilia, one of the, one of the brave five to 10% of women in some fields like mathematics or physics or electrical engineering. Uh, and then we had the uh, token humanities graduate student, Tejo, who's always protesting something. He's very passionate. And then, of course, we had this guy, this guy that everybody kind of has in their departments, you know, or girl, the one that's been 
in your department longer than anyone can remember. <laughs> Mike Slackenerny. Mike Slackenerny, whose job it is to educate the new students in the way of the PhD. So exactly money, a social life, a shave, a PhD student needs not such things. Yeah. That was actually said to me my first year <laughs> by the student called Mike. Yeah, so it's not all fiction. It's not fiction. It's from real life. Uh, and then uh, Mike, who also, like maybe a lot of you, you not only have to manage the expectations of your professors, right, and when they expect you to graduate, but you also have to manage your significant others. And when they expect you to graduate. And so I kept drawing these comics about, you know, my friends and myself and all these people in my lab. And I think people kind of related to the comics. They connected with the comics. Not just because maybe they could, you know, identify with the characters or the situations. I think people really kind of related to the comics because the subtext of the comics, kind of the hidden theme of the comics, was about asking the big question about graduate school. The big question, which is, why, <laughs> why do you put up with all those things, right? Because I'm pretty sure or none of you here today is really doing it for the money. <laughs> <coughs> so, excuse me. So, uh, let's see. Uh, a while ago, when I first started the strip, I, I can ask, like, like, how much do they pay graduate students, at least in the United States? And... Um, and uh, I looked up the survey they did in the U.S. over all these universities, over all these kinds of uh, different fields for teaching assistants, research assistants. And what happens is you can take these numbers and take the average of them to get a figure equal to $14,055 as a kind of general idea of how much they pay graduate students in the U.S. in U.S. dollars per year. <laughs> This is not per month, <laughs> per year, which is, you know, okay, it's small, but, you know, it's not, it's not bad. I mean, you could maybe survive if you eat at McDonald's every day. But to put it into perspective, let's compare this figure now. Let's, let's compare it now to how, how much you would be getting paid if you worked at McDonald's. <laughs> In California, they would pay you. Should I stop here? Should I? <laughs> They'll pay you. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whew. Fifteen dollars less. Yeah, I'm loving it. So this is kind of an old figure. A few years ago, I looked it up again, and that figure now, if you take the average, is more like 18,779, which is still ridiculously low for you guys here in Norway. But uh, in the U.S., that is the average, kind of the average, at least a few years ago, of how much they pay PhD students. And I thought that was better, you know, because of inflation, it went up. Until I also looked up how much you would get paid by the U.S. government if you're unemployed. And doing nothing, the U.S. government will pay you. Uh, <laughs> which is conclusive proof it pays more to do nothing than it does to get a PhD. So, Yeah, that didn't make a lot of sense to me. And so what I did um, next back then was uh, I took my procrastination to the next level. And I started posting all these comics on a free website on the on campus. And I think what happened was, you know, people who would read it there and they liked it, they would then tell their friends that they knew from university days, from undergraduate, who were now going to other schools about these comics. And then those people then tell other people, and then those people then tell their friends and their lab mates, and then those people then tell other people in other universities. And so slowly over the years, kind of like a, a virus, <laughs> these comics kind of went out into the world. And it was actually very interesting for me to find out that it wasn't these stories, these things, these jokes 
uh, apparently were not just applicable to Stanford University. <laughs> oh no, apparently Apparently it's a global misery phenomenon. <laughs> so that's a list of all the universities of the people who subscribe to the website up until a few years ago. Just to kind of give you a sense of who's reading these comics. And it was also, there's like a thousand universities out there uh, that read these comics. And it was also really interesting to find out that it, um, it wasn't just limited to engineering or robot robots, which is where I was coming from, or the sciences. People from all kinds of disciplines were reading these comics. So, this is a list of all those people's majors just going from about A to about C. I'm not going to scroll it because we can actually read and they're kind of interesting like to know that art history, PhD students and grad students are reading this and brain and cognitive scientists and I don't know if you guys can read this, Buddhist studies. Buddhist studies. <laughs> Known as BS, <laughs> Buddhist studies. Can you imagine that, saying, I'm getting a PhD in BS, <laughs> which in the US is not a good word, not a good word. Anyway, so that was really interesting, and even more interesting was what happened next, which is that I started to get feedback from all these people across the world, across all these different disciplines and studies, and I can kind of roughly categorize the emails I get into these four types. So the first type of email I get usually goes something like, oh god, I break down and cry, and there's a new comic, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. <laughs> and so that really makes me feel good, <laughs> knowing there are thousands of people out there crying <laughs> because of me. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, but people also thank me. They say, Jorge, thank you for drawing the comic strips. Thank you for helping me goof off. I'm supposed to be doing research, but instead I just spend days surfing your website. Like Caroline said, she spent weeks where she could have been saving the world with her research. So yeah, I'm pretty sure at this point there was probably a graduate student out there about to make an incredible discovery for humankind. You know, they were in the lab about to make this discovery that would save humanity when suddenly their lab mate goes, hey, have you checked out this website? <laughs> <sighs> and humanity took a step backwards. Yeah, thanks to me. You're welcome. Uh, but then I get a third type of comment from people. They write me and they, I get a lot of this, people write me and they say, hey, <laughs> Cecilia, your character is so hot. Can I marry her? Yeah, so this type of comment really um, disturbs me. <laughs> it's a little weird, right? Because first of all, She's an imaginary cartoon character in a comic. And second of all, she's my imaginary girlfriend. <laughs> so back off. <laughs> Stay away from her. Yeah. She's also the, uh, the mother of my imaginary child. She's, that is too much. <laughs> Yeah, make up your own imaginary boyfriends or girlfriends or, or both. We are in Norway. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so that's the type of comment. Oh, then there's a fourth type of comment. I usually, at the end, people usually say, uh, hey, you make me feel less alone. Your comic is probably responsible for make, keeping a lot of us sane. And so this type of comment, yeah, that's usually how I respond. Aw. And it makes me think maybe, just maybe all these comics, all this procrastination, it's not just a huge waste of time for humanity. Maybe, just maybe, it's just a medium-sized waste of time. 
Because, you know, I read this survey one, one time at the uh, University of California at Berkeley. They did a survey to all their graduate students, and they asked them questions about their mental health. I like how people are laughing already, because <laughs> I say grad students and mental health. So they sent this questionnaire to all their graduate students. They got back the results. And what they found was, uh, was pretty surprising. They found, first of all, that 95% of all graduate students, 95%, 95% at some point feel overwhelmed and overstressed about their PhD, about their graduate school, about their uh, life. 95%, right? That's a lot. You know, it makes me wonder, who are these other 5%? <laughs> Why are they lying? What's, what's wrong with them? Uh, actually, I figured it out. I think they're probably um, Buddhist studies. <laughs> that would make sense. 95%. So, uh, but more seriously, though, um, they also found in this report that 67% of them, so two out of every three graduate students at some point feels hopeless or depressed about their graduate career, or about their uh, work, or about their lives. So 67% of them feel hopeless and depressed. So this one is uh, a good bit more serious. You know, it's not something we should take too lightly, hopelessness and depression. It's uh, a little bit more serious, which is why I am here today <laughs> to tell you that there is an alternative. There is another way to hopelessness and depression, and that is the way of procrastination. <laughs> That's right, procrastination. <laughs> Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, which is you're probably thinking, Jorge, that's bad, right? Procrastination is bad. You know, sex, drugs, procrastination. I tell my mother I don't do those things. <laughs> but, you know, I think procrastination just gets a bad reputation. You know, people often think it's bad because I think people often, a lot of times, confuse procrastination with its very close relative, its very close cousin, which is laziness. But I like to make the argument that procrastination and laziness are not the same thing, right? They're not the same thing, right? Laziness, that's when you don't want to do anything. You don't want to do anything. Procrastination, you just don't want to do it now. <laughs> not the same thing, procrastination and laziness. And in fact, in the dictionary, all it says is that it, the procrastination is to postpone or delay needlessly, which kind of sounds bad, right? But I think it actually gives us a loophole. Because <laughs> if you can find the need for it, maybe it's not so bad. And in fact, I think there are uh, many examples throughout history where procrastination actually has worked out for the best. So here's a little bit more of my research looking at famous procrastinators in the history of humanity going all the way back to Isaac Newton. <laughs> yes, Isaac Newton and the story of how the apple fell on him and he discovered, he discovered gravity. Uh, yeah, you know, he, he, was, um, he was out there. And so I think the real question here is, um, what was he doing under that tree? Right? He wasn't in the lab working hard when he made this discovery, right? There's also the story of uh, Albert Einstein, for example. You know, I bet Einstein's mother would have loved for Einstein to have worked hard at the patent office where he had his real, where he had his real job and, you know, made his way up to middle management like he was supposed to do for his actual career. But instead, he spent a lot of time working on physics equations, which kind of... Um, Kind of worked out for Albert there. <laughs> Relatively speaking. <laughs> I apologize for that one. Yeah, there's also the story of, uh, let's see who else, Isaac Asimov, you know, the famous science fiction writer. 
I don't know how many of you know him or his work, but he's, um, he's a famous science fiction writer. But, and he has a PhD in chemistry from Columbia University. PhD in chemistry, yeah. But it took him 10 years to get that PhD. 10 years, yeah. So that's a picture of Asimov before getting his PhD. Yeah. Here's a picture of him after the PhD. <laughs> What happened before, after? And in fact, later on in his life, he wrote in his autobiography, he wrote that when he was a PhD student, his professor, his advisor, supervisor, actually told him right in front of him that he was a bad writer, that he didn't know how to write well at all. And so despite all of that, he spent a lot of time working on, you know, some of the most amazing science fiction novels of the century. Now, a few, more, a few more modern heroes of procrastination are the Yahoo and the Google guys. Yeah. Is there anyone in the room here today who does not use Yahoo or Google? <laughs> who does not use Google <laughs> for your research? No one? Yeah, so uh, and both of these companies were actually started by graduate students. I don't know how many of you know this, but they were started by graduate students. And in fact, legend has it that, uh, for example, Jerry Yang and David Filo's supervisor just happened to go on sabbatical when one of them said to the other, hey, our professor is not here right now. Do you want to try to categorize the entire internet? <laughs> before he comes back. <laughs> that is some legendary procrastination, I think. There's also, I think, uh, real science that makes the case for procrastination, real research. So for example, there's the cognitive psychologist, Teresa Amabil, who found through experiments things she calls extrinsic motivators. So outside pressures, when somebody's telling you that you have to do something, that you should do something because there's a deadline or there's going to be an award at the end or a reward at the end, it actually tends to kind of stress people out and makes them be less creative than they would normally. It tends to decrease their creativity. More recent uh, in more high tech is they look at, they look, somebody looked at brain activity, people's brain activity. When you're trying to solve problems that require insight, so open-ended problems where you have to associate different things, uh, and their hypothesis here is that when you're trying to come up with insightful solutions, you're trying to, put to kind of put together concepts in your brain that are not already obviously connected to each other in your brain. And so for that to happen, you need this kind of low-grade, almost unconscious brain activity so that if you actually try to think too much about your problem or focus on it too hard, you can actually suppress some of this important connection making. Yeah, that's right. I have references <laughs> in my slides with like et al. Look at that, et al. and everything, et al. Yeah, so there's all this history and science behind procrastination, but still people kind of think it's a bad thing, right? Kind of a, there's a negative stigma about it in society. And so I asked myself the question, you know, why is that, you know? What's really the problem with procrastination, right? What's really the problem here? And so I thought about this question for a long time, perhaps too long. But I thought about this question for a long time, and it occurred to me that maybe the answer to this question has something to do with this very typical conversation that I always seem to have Anywhere I go, anywhere in the world, when I'm talking to graduate students, this conversation that always seems to go like this. You go up to some graduate students and you say to them, hey, Vordan Gordet, <laughs> how's it going? And they usually um, reply with the same enthusiasm that you guys responded with. Usually something along the lines of, oh god, Thank you for asking, but I'm so stressed. I'm trying to graduate. Of all these things I have to do, I've only been sleeping three hours a night. And so I think you go, oh, wow, that's crazy, right? That's insane. That's crazy. You're only sleeping three hours a night? I mean, I mean that must mean that you're doing research for 21 hours a day? Really? 
And they usually answer, uh, no. <laughs> no, I, um, I goofed around a little. I went out. I watched TV. I went out with my friends. And I'm organizing this event for the, under, for the campus. Pick your favorite obscure hobby that you learn in graduate school. Club. <clears throat> Because I'm the club president. <laughs> and so you go, oh. And then they go, but I should be doing research instead. I'm supposed to be working right now. And so I thought, aha, you know, the real problem with procrastination is not that it takes away your time, or it's not that, that there aren't enough hours in a week to do all your work and to pursue all your hobbies and your interests. You know, the real problem with procrastination seems to be all about guilt. I, I always get a nice, uncomfortable silence here. <laughs> Everyone's going, hmm, ah, <laughs> guilt, right? You feel bad. Because the thing about academia, I think, as you may have found out, as you probably found out, the thing about academia is that it kind of never ends, right? There's always, at any given time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's always something else, something else, a little bit more you could be doing. You could be always reading. So it's something else that you should be doing. You could always be reading more papers, or you could be writing more papers, or reading more references, or applying for more funding, or doing more experiments, or doing more data analysis. There's always more talks you could be giving, more equipment you could be working on. Whereas I think, you know, people with regular jobs, nine to five types of jobs, it's maybe a little easier for them to just leave everything at the office at the end of the day and then just go home and relax. In graduate school, I found there's this kind of constant anxiety of always feeling like there's something else that you could be doing that you should be doing that you're supposed to be doing. And yet you find yourself a lot of the time basically... Uh, <laughs> basically doing other things. And then you feel bad and you feel guilty and depressed about it to the point where you don't even enjoy those hobbies that you used to enjoy before. And so then I ask myself, you know, why is that, you know? Like, what's the answer to that? But if you feel like you have all these things that you, you feel like you have all these things you're supposed to be doing that you should be doing that you could be doing, why can't we just do them? Why can't we just do the things we're supposed to do instead of doing other things, and you feel bad and guilty about them to the point where you don't even enjoy those things anymore. Well, I thought about this question also for a long time. <clears throat> and I think, bear with me, I think the answer in this case is a little bit simpler. I think maybe it has something to do with the fact that In fact, we just don't want to do these things. You see, this is all related to my grand theory of procrastination, or as I like to call it, my unified theory of procrastination in academia. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Only in academia would an acronym get an applause <laughs> at a lecture. Everyone's like, well done. Good job. Yeah, so uh, that's uh, my theory. And this theory of mine is, um, is based on what I called in early comics the Newton's Laws of Graduation. So maybe you already know them from the comics, from the website, or from the books. You may know these things. But for those of you who don't know, the laws of uh, Newton's laws of graduation say, the first law says that, the first law of Newton's laws of graduation says that uh, a graduate student in procrastination <laughs> only in an academic talk would a theory get an applause. Yeah, so uh, that's the first law of graduation. This is formalized more 
uh, yeah, they stay in, tend to stay in procrastination unless an external force is applied to it. Uh, this is formalized more in the second law, which says that a, uh, the HA of a doctoral or master's thesis process is directly proportional to the flexibility F given by the advisor and inversely proportional to student's motivation M. This is, um, we can formalize this more and I uh, write an equation is age of the thesis equals the amount of flexibility divided by motivation, which we can abbreviate as A equals F over M, which we can rewrite as F equals MA. And we all know you can't argue with F equals MA. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're moving at close to the speed of light, which <laughs> never happens in graduate school. <laughs> Nothing moves that fast. F equals MA. Thank you. Thank you for laughing at this equation. I do appreciate it. One time I gave this presentation to a group of arts and humanities students. <laughs> Complete silence, <laughs> not a word. Uh, yeah, so let's explore this equation, this mathematical equation. Let's explore it more, uh, more deeply. And let's start with the bottom term down here, motivation. Because you know, I think everyone comes to graduate school. <laughs> everyone comes to graduate school. Well, let's face it, you come because it seems better than a real job. But still, you get kind of excited about it, right? People come with high expectations to graduate school. They come eager to learn and to make a difference in this world with your research. You're going to change the world. And so you take that next step in your life, and you're ready to turn that corner and face the challenges of graduate school. But it turns out graduate school is actually more like here. <laughs> Or you know, if you were to um, kind of make a graph, a plot of what happens to the complex and psychological uh, state of a graduate student their first year, if you were to plot it in the motivator, <laughs> we usually see motivation start really high, but then the first year, <laughs> it all comes crashing down. And I think it all comes crashing down for a lot of grad students for several reasons, first of all. You have to get used to being average, you know? Maybe before, in your undergraduate, you were, you know, one of the smarter students, one of the best in the, in the class. You did pretty well with grades, and maybe you were even the valedictorian. But now in grad school, everybody was a valedictorian. There's not a lot of room at the top. Also, you find out in graduate school that you actually feel dumber in grad school. Contrary to what was advertised to you, you feel dumber, right? Because maybe before an undergraduate, you were fresh out of college, and you feel pretty good because the ratio between what you think you know and what you think you don't know is pretty big, pretty high, so you feel good. But then you get to grad school, and you realize you already forgot most of what you learned. But you also kind of realize how much you don't know, right? Because suddenly you're um, surrounded by all these experts in their fields and all these really brilliant people. And so then what happens is a lot of people start to compare themselves. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about here. <laughs> That person in your lab or your group that just seems to work all the time, makes all, writes all those papers, makes you want to. <laughs> but don't do it. <laughs> Trust me, it doesn't end well. Yeah, you, um, you compare yourself and you feel bad because you compare yourself to your, to your uh, other lab mates or to your professors or to your advisor, and you end up feeling like an imposter. So this is actually a very well-documented, very common thing in academics called the imposter syndrome. Have you guys heard about that? It's called the imposter syndrome. Uh, it's actually like a scientific field and everything. It's called the imposter syndrome. It's kind of like when you think that maybe the only reason that they let you into the PhD program 
was somebody made a mistake somewhere. <laughs> you feel like you don't belong, that you're somehow fooling people to thinking that you're smarter than you actually are. You feel like you don't belong. Still, you, uh, you kind of hang in there. And maybe you get excited about the research project that you picked for your thesis, or the project that was picked for you for your thesis. But you get excited about it, right, because it's pretty interesting and cool. But then you also find out it's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible, and somebody already did it. Maybe uh, you get motivated about your qualifying exams or your finals. Then you actually pass, and you can't even get out of bed anymore. Still, you hang in there. You hang on. The motivation chart, you slowly claw your way up, little by little, around those mid-years. And you make some progress until that one day when you get that phone call you know that phone call from your friend? You know that phone call, right, from your friend? The one that didn't go to graduate school? And they're telling you over the phone, oh yeah, we have this great life. We have this family, I have a family, we just had a baby. A real baby. <laughs> They, uh, they're earning all this money in, the, in this industry. They just bought a house. And you think, what? You can buy houses? <laughs> you drive a nice car. Meanwhile, you're on the other line, all by yourself, alone at night, still in the lab, eating ramen noodles. <laughs> Or what is that cheese called, the brown cheese? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what's it called? Brown cheese. Brown cheese, brown. Oh, OK. That's a better name for it. Brown cheese. What should we call this? Brown cheese. So what was I saying? <laughs> Let's not talk about cheese. Uh, yeah, so you're in there, and then, then you're talking to, to your friend who didn't go to grad school, and you feel bad. And so a lot of people at that point in their PhDs or their masters, they start to feel a little scared. That's when things start to look scary, because that's when you start to get fear. Fear of a couple of things. First of all, fear of failure. You know, I think. A lot of us, those who make it this far are a little bit overachievers, and so we have a hard time maybe admitting to ourselves when we're not meeting our expectations or when we're disappointing people. And, and so we have a hard time admitting to ourselves when it's better to just keep moving on. But then the problem is we also get fear of moving on. Because, <laughs> you know, grad school can be a relatively comfortable living situation. You can walk into your lab at, what, 10 a.m., 11, 11, 11 a.m. How many people came straight from their apartments to this lecture at 4.30 p.m.? One for two people. All right. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, a lot of people hesitate because they actually um, they freak out and they're afraid of what will happen if they actually graduate, right? Because when you graduate, you have to decide what you want to be when you grow up. <laughs> and so you, uh, you're afraid of what will happen when you go out there beyond the walls of academia, out there. It's kind of like what happens to people in prison. <laughs> So a lot of people are going to freak out, and they, uh, they freak out, and so they end up doing other things, a lot of other things, instead of focusing on their research. They end up procrastinating a lot. And so my message to you guys here today is that if you ever find yourselves in that situation where you find yourself procrastinating a lot, my message to you guys here today is it's OK. <laughs> it's OK. Because a very significant point for me in my graduate career 
was uh, uh, at some point in my graduate, in my PhD, I took a class from this professor called Bernie Roth. And Bernie Roth uh, is this world famous, world renowned uh, authority and research and expert in the field of robotics and kinematics. Perhaps um, none of you have heard of him. <laughs> But Bernie Roth is also this kind of groovy 70s kind of dude. And so he'd always challenge his class. He would always challenge his class. Just like I'm going to challenge you guys here right now uh, to tell me what are some of the things, I'm going to challenge you guys here right now, just like he challenged us and me, to tell me, tell me what are some of the things in life that you have to do. You know, let's start with that. What are some of the things in life that you have to do? Sleep. Sleep. What's that? What's that? Eat. Eat, sleep. Yeah, what else? Pay taxes when you don't have the money. <laughs> <laughs> Pay taxes when you don't have the money. I, I sense a Norwegian thing here. Drink. Drink, you have to drink. Yeah, so Bernie's point, uh, this professor's point was that, you know, over the many years he would always talk to grad students and he would hear them use language like that. Like, oh, I'm really stressed out, I have to finish this report, I have to publish this paper, I have to publish more, I have to get a good faculty position, I have to graduate, I have to get a job, I have to um, do all these things. And his point was that, you know what, in life, there's really nothing that you have to do. <laughs> Basically, nobody's making you do any of these things, not even to sleep, not even to eat, not even to pay taxes when you don't have the money. Basically, everything you do, he would say, everything you do, he would say, you do it because you want to do it. And so I thought, hey, whoa, that's really interesting, right? If that's true, then I say that procrastination is what you do when you're doing what you want to be doing. Right? If everything you do, you do it because you want to do it, then even procrastination has that kind of equal value, and so it's a good thing, right? Just ignore the logical fallacies here. <laughs> just not. Yeah, the main point is to maybe just uh, relax a little bit, enjoy it, and listen to your inner procrastinator. <laughs> now, I know what some of you are probably thinking right now, which is, Jorge, all this procrastination stuff, that's all nice and good, but how does that help me? Graduate. What if I never graduate? How does procrastination help me get out of Oslo? <laughs> you know, um, how does it help me graduate? Well, fortunately for everybody, in this theory, there are also other terms in the equation. So as small as this bottom term here may get for you, inevitably the upper term up here <laughs> will get even smaller. Because one of the things I noticed in talking to a lot of people who um, have finished their um, PhDs is that actually, so here I would try to make a joke about L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule. Only the four mathematicians in the room would laugh. <laughs> but yeah, essentially, essentially the main motivation, the main impetus to finish and the decision to graduate is essentially made uh, for you. Inevitably, what happens is I notice in talking to a lot of people with PhDs is that inevitably what happens is that um, is that you run out of time, you run out of funding, you run out of, um, or you're, you'll find a job you really like, or you'll suddenly find out you're having a baby, or your significant other moves to another country or another city, and so all of a sudden you'll have a deadline you will not want to miss. Because that's, I think, one of the things that I feel I learned that nobody ever tells you about finishing your master's or your PhD thesis, is that nobody's ever really happy with their thesis. If you ask anyone who's finished their PhDs, even your postdocs, even your professors, if they were 100%, 100% happy with the final product they turned in at the end, most likely, I would bet they'll tell you, uh, not 100%. Most likely, I bet they'll tell you they run out of time, they run out of money, they just had to grab all the, any papers they had written, anything, everything they had done, 
anything they could, put it all together into one document, make sure all the margins were the right, <laughs> the right side, and then just shoved it out the door. Because the other thing I notice about uh, PhDs in academia is that, you know, if you look at anyone who's famous in your fields of research, any of the big names, any of the world-renowned experts in their fields, in your fields, if you look at them and you look at the work they're famous for, most likely, I would bet, you know, they're not famous for the work they did as graduate students, right? Most likely they're famous for the work they did as professors, right? <laughs> it's a little scary, I know. <laughs> But yeah, they were famous for the work they did when they were professors, right? That makes sense. Because then they had grad students do the work for them. <laughs> and so at some point you realize all these secrets and you'll ramp up the motivation chart and maybe you get to the point where you defend your thesis. Or at least write the outline for your thesis. But then it gets a little bit uh, bumpy and up, a few more ups and downs, which I don't have time to cover here right now. I'll leave that for my future work. <laughs> future work. But I will say that um, something else that was really helpful for me that I feel uh, is helpful for people a lot of people don't see is that I find that a lot of grad students kind of stress out because they form an image in their heads of their professors as these omnipotent beings, these all-powerful things, looking down upon them and judging their every move, every word they say. You feel like they're judging you the whole time. And so I like to tell grad students that, you know what, if you take a step back, you'll realize that, you know, you're a professor. Well, probably, probably. probably doesn't think you're an idiot, you know? Because the fact is that he or she really, um... <laughs> really doesn't think about you that much. And so uh, just to finish up my presentation here, I, I like to have this slide as well. And I like to put this at the end because, you know, I feel like people see my comic strip and they see my presentations and they uh, think that I probably have a very cynical view of graduate school and academia and getting your PhD. And so uh, one of the most common questions that people ask me is like, hey, do you wish that you had not gone to graduate school or do you wish you had quit graduate school earlier? But I always tell people that, no, you know, I'm really glad that I went to graduate school. I'm really glad that I was able to stick with it and finish the PhD because I do feel you learn a lot of very important skills in the process in getting going to graduate school, a lot of very important transferable skills that will help you not just in academia if you decide to stay, but into whatever industry that you choose for yourself in the future. Very important skills that you learn, starting with, first of all, <laughs> you get pretty good at PowerPoint <laughs> animations. That's one skill. The second most important skill I learned was how to write bullet item lists. <laughs> but by far the most important skill I learned as a PhD was how to give a one hour presentation on any topic, <laughs> even procrastination. <laughs> now I joke around with this, but I'm actually serious about this. You know, by this I mean, uh, and, you know, in, the, in graduate school, you learn the ability to teach yourself anything technical that you need to learn to become an independent self-learner. You learn the ability to think analytically and be able to kind of break things down into their components. And most important, you learn the ability to kind of keep in mind the big picture of things and then be able to communicate that to other people. Now everyone's really angry at me because <laughs> he had a positive message. <sighs> So I'll leave you guys with the words of Mike Slackenerny, <laughs> who said, grad school is a state of mind. And which state would that be? Preferably sleeping, which you are interrupting. Now go away. So thank you so much.
Can I just say a few more? No, go ahead. So thank you, Jorge, for a very interesting talk. I'm sure all of you could relate to what he said. Um, are there any questions ex auditorio? <laughs> Anyone, come on. What about us who are not grad students uh, yet? Um, not me. Um, <laughs> uh, and all already kind of feel at a bachelor's uh, level that we have a little bit too much to do all the time. Like, am I just going to become better at tackling it or? Um, do I just not know what it <laughs> actually being stressed all the time feels like or something? Yeah, it gets worse. <laughs> I'm not going to sugarcoat it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just you're more, uh, you're expected to be more independent. I think that's the main thing. And so a lot of, I mean, it's probably this, maybe you're on the same workload, but you're just expected to be more independent. And, you won't have somebody kind of guiding you and holding your hand the whole time. It'll be more. You'll be more. It'll be more open-ended. Yeah. But yeah. Good luck. <laughs> um. I see another hand. So how did you survive the end of your PhD? How did I survive my PhD? <laughs> Was that the question? Yes. Uh. Well, I had this great um, coping mechanism, which was to draw comics. <laughs> about my experiences. So yeah, that helped me a lot, I think, just um, just being able to express my frustrations in the comic strip. Yeah. So that's another reason I think it's also important to have hobbies and to not feel guilty about them. Yeah. More questions? OK. So are you in the? In the field of robotics or in the comics now? <laughs> Am I in the field of robotics or in, in the comics? In the comics world. You mean like what is your reward after finishing your PhD? Yeah, like what am I doing with my life? Yes. <laughs> like how's my research going? <laughs> Did you learn nothing? Is this on? Is this microphone working? Yeah, no. How's your research going? <laughs> no, so uh, let's see. Uh, after I finished my PhD, I, I was an adjunct professor at Caltech for a while. And then I, I saw that the, my academic uh, um, value was kind of decreasing the, more, the longer you waited. And then I saw the traffic for this website, comics website, go <laughs> going the other way. So I switched curves. And so I've been doing the comics full time now for like uh, a long time, almost 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's very impressive. <laughs> PhD in robotics, cartoonist. OK, uh, another question from uh, the first Messanin. Oh, I can't. Sorry. Uh, you mentioned you what uh, your thesis was about um, <coughs> robots that moved like cockroaches, and then you mentioned that uh, someone al always beats you to it. Were you actually beaten? Did someone do the same research just be, uh, ahead of you? Um, no, of course not. <laughs> no, I was I was kind of scooped. You know, there were a lot of people working on this problem, so you just kind of have to find. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, a very narrow definition of your research, and then and then nobody else can beat you to it <laughs> because nobody else is doing it. Yeah. Okay, I saw another hand. More questions? Okay, one last chance. Well, I do have to. I do have to say this. Um, so after, after, so we're gonna have a book signing where I'll, you can buy and I'll sign a book for you if you like. But after that, we're gonna show the PhD movie here, uh, so you can stick around and watch it if you like. It's a movie based on my comics that I uh, that I produce with some people at Caltech, and so it's all actually real graduate students 
in it as as the as the actors and as the director and the producer. They're all real graduate students. Uh, so you guys can stick around and watch it. Incidentally, right now at this point, we're trying to uh, raise money to make a sequel for the movie, the PhD movie two. So if you go to phdcomics.com, there's a Kickstarter where we're trying to reach a certain goal of money where people donate to for us to make this movie. And so I committed myself on Twitter. I said, if we reach uh, $30,000 by the time that this talk starts, I, uh, I'm going to take my shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> and so I figured. <laughs> and so I figured you guys are, are kind of uh, into that kind of thing. <laughs> so it would be okay. But what's the figure? What's the figure right now? Thirty-two thousand and one cent and one dollar. <laughs> Talk about procrastination. <laughs> So I apologize if this is inappropriate, but I have to do this. <laughs> okay. Then on behalf of the Science Library, uh, I would like to thank you for creating, <laughs> yeah, taking off your shirt, and creating the comics that we all love and, and read. And thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to give you a present. The brown cheese. <laughs> we always give a present to our speakers here. Um, and the last time we have someone from California coming, um, we gave him an umbrella. <laughs> um, umbrellas. And even though it's raining today, um, we decided that an umbrella might not be the most used item in California. So um, I'm not sure a wool blanket <laughs> is the most frequently used. <laughs> um, but we hope that we'll, you will remember us when or if you ever use it. Oh, so here you, so you are. Oh, and as he said, we will, uh, he will sell and sign books now. Uh, you can buy them there and, and it will be signed on stage and afterwards we will show the PhD movie. Thank you all for coming and uh, I hope to s you stick around. Really great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're just Thank you very much for